So today we're talking again about confidence intervals and let's go look at an applet to try and look at the meaning of it. So what this applet does is we can take a sample, so here's one sample, from a population. Now this population has a mean of 13 because I told it to. And you can see that when we took a sample, we got a sample mean of 12.6 and the little green line right here, if you can see that, the little green line represents the confidence interval that we get from that sample mean of 12.6. And you can see that this confidence interval does contain the true mean of 13. So this vertical line here is for the true mean of 13. Now I could take another sample, and this time I got a sample mean of 14.5, and its confidence interval still contains my population mean of 13. So notice I'm just going to keep taking a different sample, and my confidence interval, watch the confidence interval, it keeps changing. So my confidence interval keeps moving back and forth because each different sample gives me a different sample mean, and hence a different confidence interval. But all of our confidence intervals so far have contained my population mean. Now let's make this faster. Let's do a hundred samples at a time. So we put each sample, there's a little black dot to tell you what the mean is. And then if the confidence interval contains the 13, they make it green. But look at this one right here, okay, this red one. Notice that my sample mean here was so high, it had a sample mean of 15.2. And so its confidence interval doesn't actually contain the true value of 13. In fact, there's one, two, three, four, five of them here that don't actually contain my true population mean of 13. So most of the confidence intervals, I get a sample mean that's so close that my confidence interval contains the true population mean. But every once in a while, I get one that doesn't actually contain my true population mean. So the question is, how many times do my confidence intervals contain the true mean? And it's going to be about 95% of the time. See down here, 95% of them. And that's what the 95% confidence level means. So coming back here, I have a little picture here so you can remember it later. So each of the little red dots represents the sample mean and you have your confidence interval. So like this one here doesn't contain mu. But most of them do. And 95% of the confidence intervals. Contain you. And so that's what the actual confidence level tells you. And it says when you go and take a sample, the confidence interval that results may or may not contain your actual mean. But if you do a 95% confidence interval, 95% of all the possible confidence intervals would contain your population mean mu. So let's look at some theory. The general form for confidence intervals is every confidence interval can, can be written in the form of an estimate plus or minus a critical point times the standard deviation of the estimate. Or if you have to estimate the standard deviation, we call it the standard error. So what we did on the previous page is we did x bar plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation of x bar. So this is our estimate of mu, this is our critical point that we got from the z table, and this is our standard deviation of x bar. So every confidence interval comes in this form. So our official confidence interval is called a one sample z confidence interval. We use this when we know the population standard deviation. So here's your confidence interval. We'll do x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2. This alpha over 2 is what we call our critical point. Sigma over the square root of n. And you can see here they just split up into the minus and plus and made an actual interval. Now this interval is going to be exact if the population distribution is normal and approximately correct if the sample size is large of at least 30 for any population. And this z alpha over 2 is called our critical point. And the way we find z alpha over 2 is we say if we want a 1 minus alpha in the middle, so that's like 95% in the middle. Let's do our specific one first. It's usually easier to go from specifics to generals. So if I want a 95% confidence interval, 
That would mean I want 95% or 0.95 in the middle. And then I need to figure out how much would be in each tail. So I'll do 1 minus 0.95 and divide that by 2. So I get 0 0.025. So if I want 0 0.95 in the middle, I have 0 0.025 in each tail. And so I would want to look up on my chart Z, the Z value that has 0 0.025 area to the right. And we know from looking that up a few times already that that's going to be 1.96. Now coming back over here to our general example, that 1 minus alpha is what goes in the middle. And so it's alpha over 2 in each tail. And this is Z with alpha over 2 area to the right. I try not to memorize this. I just every single time draw a picture and do it out this way. Okay. Well, the part that you add or subtract up here, so this part that you add or subtract, that's called your margin of error. So we'll write it here. We'll say M is for margin of error equals Z alpha over 2 sigma over square root. That's called your margin of error for when you're estimating mu by X bar. Your 1 minus alpha is your confidence level. That's like your 95%, 99% confidence levels. And you can either write your confidence interval form with a sigma x bar, or instead of writing sigma x bar every time, you can just do sigma over the square root of n. You'll notice up here I have open brackets. Down here we have closed brackets. It's because it doesn't truly matter to us. We don't really care if they're open or closed. So let's try it out. An automaker has introduced a new mid-size model and wishes to estimate the mean gas mileage mu for all the cars of this type. Let's assume that our population standard deviation is 0.8. They took a sample of 50 cars. The sample mean is 31.56. Let's find the margin of error for our 95% confidence interval. First, I always write down what they give me. So sigma equals 0.8. My sample size is 50. The sample mean equals 31.56. And we want a 95% confidence interval. So I'll draw a picture. We want 0.95 in the middle. That means 0.025 on each side. And so I go to my normal table. And I'm looking up the value that would have 0.025 to the right. Sometimes it's easier to look up 0.025 to the left. Let's look up 0.025 as an area. So here we go. So we're at negative 1.96. So if this is negative 1.96, then this is going to be 1.96. So my z alpha over 2 equals 1.96. Now to find your margin of error, the formula for that is, just go to your formula, it's the part that you're adding or subtracting. So it's your z alpha over 2, sigma over the square root of n. So in our case it's going to be 1.96 times 0.8 over the square root of 50, which equals 0.2217. So that's your margin of error. Now let's find and interpret our 99% confidence interval. So that's x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 sigma over the square root of n. Now we already calculated that margin of error up above, so we don't need to redo it. We can just do 31.56 for your sample mean, plus or minus our 0.2217. So we'll take our calculator and first you do 31.56 minus the 0.2217, so you get 31.33. And then you do a plus and you get 31.78. So this is my confidence interval. And then we can interpret it and we'd say we are 95% confident. That the true population mean mileage, so the true average for all the cars 
is between 31.33 and 31.78. Now they get a tax credit if the population mileage is at least 31. So do you think it's plausible that the mean mileage for all the cars is at least 31? And I would say yes, because this entire interval of 31.33 to 31.78 is higher than 31. So yes, because 31.33 to 31.78 is higher than 31. So if we're 95% confidence between those two numbers, it would be then higher than 31. Okay, now just as a little warning here, this is one of the most important things to me is that you can interpret these correctly. So we found that the 95% confidence interval for the population mean gas mileage is our 31.3, 31.7. This does not mean that the probability is 0.95 that the true mean falls between those two numbers. The true mean itself, we don't know what it is, but it is fixed, it's random, it's not changing. If we had all the population data, we could just calculate it. Okay, and so it's not, this isn't something that uh, is happening by chance. We're not picking the right numbers or something. The population mean is out there. It's fixed. All the cars already exist. The population mean can't change. And so it doesn't really make sense to talk about the probability of mu. Instead, it's our interval that changes based on which sample we choose. And so that 95% is how often our confidence intervals actually contain mu. Let's try another example. A sample of 100 bank customers has a mean waiting time of 5.46. So I'd say n equals 100. Um, my sample mean is 5.46. Assume the standard deviation for all the customers, so that means your population standard deviation is 2.47. Now let's find and interpret the 99% confidence, confidence interval for the mean waiting time. Okay, so now I want a 99% confidence interval. So this is different. Now we need 0.99 in the middle. And so if I do 1 minus that and divide by 2 for both tails, I'm going to get 0.005 for each tail. So I'll go to my normal table and let's look up this 0.005 in the left. Oh, wait, I forgot for a minute. If you look on the second page of your normal table, we have these nice little values for you for your critical points, so where it actually tells you the area to the right. So if you have 0 0.005 area to the right, then your z-value is 2.576. So this is 2.576 is your z of 0 0.005. So when I come over here to my formula, x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 sigma over the square root of n, and I plug everything in, We'll get 5.46 for my sample mean, plus or minus my critical point of 2.576, times my standard deviation of 2.47, over the square root of 100. So this will give me 5.46 plus or minus 0.636, and 4.824 to 6.096. So there's my 99% confidence interval. And to interpret it, we'll say we are 99% confident that the average waiting time for all, okay, so notice I'm emphasizing it's the average for all is the population mean. Let's see, for all the customers, is between 4.824 and 6.096 minutes. And what does the 99% confidence level mean? The actually 99% of it, what does that 99% mean? It means of all the possible samples we could have picked, Um, we would get we would get a sample mean that 
resulted in a confidence interval that actually contained mu, or the population mean, with 99% of the samples. So 99% of the samples will give us the sample mean because it's a confidence interval that contains mu. So we get that 99% of the samples, and then 1% of the samples will unfortunately give us a result that's not accurate. And do you think it's plausible that the population mean waiting time is less than 5.5 minutes? So we want to know if it's less than 5.5, but our confidence interval goes from 4.8 to 6.096. So I would say we can't really tell because some values in our confidence interval are less than 5.5 but some are greater. So this confidence interval isn't actually going to help us answer that question. We would want to maybe a more precise narrow interval to answer that. So let's look at the length of confidence intervals. And let's see, due to a lot of past data, we can safely assume that the standard deviation for the population of credit card debts for student college students is 3,500. So let's say sigma equals 3,500. And we want to find the margin of error for each situation. So in this one, we have our confidence level is 95% for both, but we change our sample size from 300 to 1,200. If our confidence level is 95%, then that critical point is 1.96, which I just remember from looking it up a lot. And then our margin of error is going to be, let's see, margin of error equals Z, alpha over 2, or your critical point times sigma over the square root of it. So if we plug all of that in, we get 1.96 times 3,500 over the square root of our sample size, which is 300. So this gives me 396. For my margin of error of 1,200, we'll do exactly the same thing, but just change that 300 to 1,200. And that goes down to 198. So you can see here in the graphic, when I switch from n equals 300 to 1200, my margin of error got a lot smaller. My interval is now narrower. So let's write that. When we increase the sample size, the margin of error decreases. Or in other words, the confidence interval gets smaller and more precise. So when it's smaller, that kind of has a smaller range of value, so it's more precise. My next one, we're going to keep the sample size the same, but we change the confidence level. When you change the confidence level, your critical point for 95%, we found earlier today, it's 1.96. For 99%, we found that it's 2.575. So our margin of error, if we just do the exact same thing as up above, we're going to get 198 and 260. So you can see here my 99% confidence interval is wider and the 95% is smaller. Okay. So if you increase the confidence level, the confidence interval gets wider. So, for a higher confidence level, the margin of error increases, or the confidence interval gets wider. Okay. So let's look at this one here. A high confidence level says our method almost always gives correct results. That would be talking about accuracy. Accuracy means, does it actually contain mu? A higher confidence level, though, requires longer confidence intervals, which then means that it is, again, well, we haven't gotten to that point, but that would mean it is going to be less precise. Because a small margin of error says our interval is a precise estimate of the parameter. So precise means 
more useful. Okay. Because you can always make a really wide interval and eventually you'll be guaranteed to be correct. For example, if I told you that the weather tomorrow, the temperature of the weather tomorrow is going to be between 0 degrees and 500 degrees, of course I'm going to be correct. I'll be accurate. But it's not very precise. We prefer to be within a couple degrees of the true value. So we want our intervals to be accurate, and the wider they are, the more accurate they'll be. But you don't want them to be too wide because then they're not going to be useful. But one of the things, nice things is your larger sample size will always give you smaller, more accurate, and more precise confidence intervals. So larger sample size just always help with everything. So we kind of have this dilemma of we want high confidence levels, meaning that they're accurate, but you don't want the confidence intervals to be too wide because then they aren't precise, meaning useful. <clears throat> The nice thing though is if you just increase your sample size, you can achieve more accuracy and more precision. Okay, so we talked about wanting a large sample size, but people don't want to actually spend more money than they have to when they conduct studies, so they don't want a bigger sample size than they have to get. So one of the things we can do is before we collect our data, we can choose our sample size to get a desired margin of error. Now of course, to do this, all of our calculations we had to know our standard deviation sigma. So let's assume somehow you know the population standard deviation sigma, or at least a good guess of it. Then your margin of error is your critical point times sigma over square root of n. We can just rearrange this and solve for n and get n equals our critical point times sigma over m squared. m is again your margin of error. So let's try this. Suppose we want to survey college students and find the mean credit card debt, and we know that sigma equals 3,500. If we want the margin of error to be 150 with 95% confidence, what sample size do we need? Okay, so they told us segment equals 3,500. We want our margin of error to be 150. And we want a 95% confidence. And 95% confidence means that our critical point will be 1.96. You can look this up each time. But for 95%, you'll probably memorize it before too long. Okay, so let's see what n needs to be. We'll just come up and use this formula. So it's our critical point times sigma over our margin of error squared. So 1.96 times 3,500 over our margin of error of 150 squared gives me 2,091.5. And we'll always round up. And so we'll round to 2,092. So if you do at least 2,092 students, you'll get a margin of error of 150 or less.